What is up and welcome to another edition of the Bruin Bible. Will Decker, your host. Make sure you guys are liking and subscribing the podcast. We are brought to you guys today by our advertisers. Our advertisers are Bell to Bell Fitness, Shator, a realtor out in Arizona, former Bruin alum, and my main man, Howard Chang, a realtor right here in Los Angeles. Let's go through them, guys. Uh, Bell to Bell Fitness is a boxing gym on the West Coast used by their FIT acronym, Fight Inspired Training. My main man, Tony Gonzalez, was the boxing coach for UCLA for over 10 years. He has built this gym on the West Side to learn how to boxing, stay in shape, and get you all the essentials you need to become somebody that is obsessed with boxing and fitness. Make sure to check it out. Go into Belt to Belt Fitness and say you heard about it from the Bruin Bible, and you're going to get a free session with Tony Gonzalez. So make sure to check that out. Shea Tor, my main man. Shea Tor is a real a licensed real estate agent in Arizona and a lifelong Bruin. He's a current Wooden Athletic Fund donor and football season ticket holder. When not selling houses or going to UCLA games, he loves to travel the country checking out different arenas, ballparks, and stadiums. If you're looking to make the move to Arizona or know someone who is, please reach out to our loyal friend, Mr. Shea Tor. His phone number is 602-487-3975. Once again, his number is 602-487-3975. Make sure to check that out. And then the local realtor we got out here, Howard Chang. Howard Chang is a local realtor with the Serene team at EXP Realty. Their team has an office right here in Culver City. Though they help clients buy and sell homes all over the L.A. County and the surrounding areas, Howard and his team do a ton of business and are super in tune with the market, knowing winning strategies to give their clients a competitive advantage, have amazing vendor referrals, are a one-stop shop for anything real estate, and just provide a ton of value for their clients. Howard and his partner, Kyle Draper, are UCLA alums and a huge, huge fans of the UCLA football and basketball programs. You will often see them at games, tailgating and networking and staying involved with the UCLA alumni community. They would love to help any fellow alumni with accomplishing their real estate goals. So if you guys have any real estate needs in the LA area, look no further. Howard is your guy. All right, guys, we're going to go into the episode. What is up, guys? And welcome to the latest edition of the Bruin Bible. Will Decker, your host, joined by the man, the myth, the legend to my right, Mr. Jamal Madney in the house. And we had, you know, an unfortunate weekend with the football game. But we're excited to talk to you guys uh, about us moving forward with what's going on. Ironically, we were going to try to plan a trip to go to LSU. But given the current state of the team, I think it's in our best interest to not <laughs> go out to this game, knowing what may be on the horizon for this. Man, man, we're already dealing with some more injuries than we expected from last week. Jay Doia injured right now as it stands, which is a massive loss. And, you know, it, it bothers me, Mad Men, because I think – when people look at defensive linemen, they go, where are the sacks? Where are the sacks? When you're a defensive tackle, outside of the freak of natures, as it is, is the Aaron Donalds, the DeForest Buckners of the world, your job is to clog the lanes you know, for the offensive linemen, make it easy for your linebackers to come in and influence the run game and some other things. And Jay Toya, in recent memory, probably the best defensive tackle we've had since the great Kenny Clark, who's still in the NFL and humming today so to lose him keanu williams was on crutches in the indiana game and then our depth i mean gary smith was a very serviceable rotation player is out as well and the kind of the tweet i had today man was you know this this could get really ugly and we want to kind of buckle our seat belts you know as somebody that covers the university you're an alumnus of this university you know we're always pulling for the best interests of the bruins and their fan base but we also want to be completely transparent. Like this is a very, this is gonna be a very, very tough season for UCLA. What were your first thoughts uh, with Jay Toya heading to the injured reserve list, and how do we even fare moving forward without the likes of our key cog on the defense, man? Yeah, well, it was a really tough blow today to to hear that and and to sort of absorb it. I I would go as far as saying it was probably the one guy that was is most irreplaceable on this team and you know you and I talked about it in the offseason remember when when Toya's flirtation kind of took place with the transfer portal there was an opportunity to go to Texas for kind of a robust six-figure amount we had a show we had a discussion around him being the most irreplaceable you know individual and how that would sort of impact the entire defensive dynamic the schematics and so forth 
And I think we're back here, Will, because I, I think this is a an even more significant loss, as crazy as it sounds, than than if you lost Ethan Garbers, frankly. Because if you just look at the composition of this defense, you know, we're still sort of searching for answers on the edge. And so when you're searching for answers on the edge in terms of that front seven, you want to be able to hang your hat on the fact that you at least have sort of the interior taken care of. And when you lose Toia, and you said it so well, Will, you know, with, with, the, with the defensive tackles, I mean, it really is that hockey assist. It's their play sets up the play, you know, that it, in that domino chain to then go get the statistics. So you can't look at a defensive tackle based on just stats and output. It's how they're setting up the output of others. And in that regard, Toia is has just been absolutely phenomenal, as has Keanu Williams. And so there's sort of a three-pronged effect here, Will. You know, number one is you lose these two guys in addition to now you've got question marks on the interior as you do on the edge. So now your whole kind of defensive front is really questionable. Two, we know that depth is an issue, right, with this team in terms of kind of the drop-off, particularly defensively, between, you know, the first two, three guys and then that next wave. And so you're wondering, not just in terms of being able to lose Toya and Keanu Williams, but what a huge drop it's going to be and who's going to sort of replace them and their lack of experience. And then three, Will, this was already going to be a difficult matchup for the very reason that LSU brings in one of the best offensive lines in all of college football. I think that they preseason many thought they were the best I mean they have four NFL quality offensive linemen in that first five two of them are on the big board here Will as as top 15 top 16 picks in the first round okay so yeah in Campbell and Jones right and so you you know you it it was going to be their hands full on the with this defensive front with Campbell and Jones to begin with now you take away Toia and you take away Keanu Williams potentially and I mean how do you generate any sort of discomfort now you know from a a, a defensive perspective on Garrett Nussmeyer how do you try and clog up holes you know for the run game how do you sort of put pressure on him I think we're staring into a situation right now Will that LSU probably only punts once in this game if at all I mean that's kind of my over under here just because now the matchup between LSU's offensive line and UCLA's defensive line there's such a chasm now that I think LSU is going to kind of be able to do what they want the hope is going to be now on the back end that you know you get physical with their receivers they drop some passes the linebackers come and contain but in in terms of that pure front you know front to front trenches to trenches this is this is a wild mismatch now in terms of what UCLA's four is going to be versus what LSU's five is going to be. Yeah, and it's I mean it's going to be it's going to be tough because when you have the caliber of offensive line as you so eloquently laid out that LSU does have and Nussmeyer is a you know above average quarterback. This guy can move the rock. I know six of his 10 touchdown passes did come against Nickel State, but you look at the receivers and the quality of talent he's throwing to. Kyron Lacy is making an early case and maybe being a Blitnikoff yes. front runner. Five touchdowns in the first three games of the season. Mason Taylor might be the best tight end in the SEC right now. And Aaron Anderson, you can't leave him out. He's leading the team in catches overall. So you got just that kind of three-headed monster in the receiving game. Nussmeyer, obviously a highly recruited quarterback. But, man, just the, the sad reality of this madman that drives me crazy is this LSU team looks very beatable, if I'm being honest with you, man. Had we had the Chip Kelly team, I'm getting vibes of 2021. And the biggest thing with this LSU team that they just have not been able to get right since Brian Kelly has been there, this does not look like a defense that LSU has trotted out in quite a while. And, you know, last year, they were kind of the SEC's version of what USC was across town where – they had the high-profile offense. They had a Heisman-winning quarterback, just like Caleb Williams was at USC. But they ranked respectively 108th in total defense for LSU and 121st in total defense for USC. They couldn't get anybody off the field. And through the early returns of the season, Madman, if you you know you study the tape and kind of figure it out, they lose the first game in kind of heartbreaking fashion to USC. 
They were up by two points to Nichols State in the third quarter, 23-21. Nussmeyer kind of found some more rhythm in the second half of that game. But Nichols State was very much in that game. They let up a 65-yard run to the starting quarterback of Nichols State to make that a two-point contest. And then, my God, the South Carolina game last weekend may have been the best you know game in college football all weekend. They score to take the lead with a minute 12 left. South Carolina drives the extent of the field. It's a three-point game. South Carolina's got a 49-yard field goal attempt. They hook it just right, you know, to prevent it from sending it to overtime. But you ask any Gamecocks fan, any college football fan, L- I mean, LSU got lucky to win that game entirely. I mean, that was that was South Carolina's W up until the last two minutes of the game. They kind of just imploded, so it was very unfortunate. I mean, it just gives you vibes of 2021 when they came in to the Rose Bowl, you know, Ed Orgeron going, you know, take off that sissy blue. And then we just <laughs> beat them. it was such a magical time. That's still one of my favorite games we covered, you know, within the LA football network. That was my first year, you know, covering with this team. So such a bright memory. I'm going to pin this question back to you because obviously we have, you know, Kiana, we got Toye out, Kafusi and Tapaki will likely take their spot in the defensive tackle rotation. But no, nobody's really expecting anything magical after the Indiana game. Let me pin this question back to you. What does success look like? Or how should we measure success in a game that feels unwinnable and untenable for UCLA football? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a great question. And I think, you know, you, you so eloquently described the state of LSU because you said it best, Will. It was sort of a nip tuck game with SC. I think they, I think truthfully, they lost that game more than SC won that game. You know, they, they kind of had the lead there in the third quarter. They had a couple possessions where they could have made it two possessions. Nussmeyer made some questionable throws at the end of that game where they could have really taken the lead again. And then you said it, Will. I mean, Nicholas State, it was 23 21 midway through the third. And I'll go one step further, Will, with South Carolina. They should have lost that game. Yeah. And I, it shouldn't even have come down to that field goal. If you recall, with about six minutes left in the game, Nussmeyer threw a, an end-to-end pick six. It was a 100-yard pick six. And South Carolina got penalized for the guy that hit Nussmeyer on the return. And Nussmeyer was 20 yards away from, from the play. It had really nothing to do with it. There was kind of a boneheaded play and also kind of a questionable call because it wasn't a blindside hit. And so LSU got so lucky to win that South Carolina game. Otherwise, they would be staring at the barrel of one and two. And you said it, Will. Challenges defensively for LSU. But even beyond that, there's a discipline issue with LSU right now. When you look at the number of penalties uh, that they're getting, I mean, they're averaging 10-plus penalties. Uh, uh, over the first three games and just boneheaded penalties like excessive celebrations guys that just you know totally self-inflicted so there's a discipline challenge right now there's a defense challenge right now they absolutely look vulnerable uh coming back home here at one and two and they're kind of hoping that this becomes kind of a get well game for them but there's a lot of vulnerability and so for me will what success looks like is are you able two things? One is given where they are defensively, can you move the ball on offense? I mean, if you're UCLA, are you getting into a position where Ethan Garbers is getting the ball into the hands of his playmakers? UCLA should be able to move the, the, the football. This should not be a 200 yards of total offense type of game. I, you know, I this should be a team that's north of 300, north of 350 against this LSU defense. So that's the first thing I'm looking for is Garbers' ability to complete passes, get the ball to his playmakers, get them in space, and try and strain this defense that has looked very modest, very average at best uh, with uh, uh, against limited competition. And again, Will, you know, Nicholas State was vertically challenged. South Carolina was vertically challenged, right? They, they, they sort of gave up the big plays to SC at, at the end. So they haven't been used to sort of a team that can run and throw. And so what I'm really looking for offensively is a nice mix. This is a game and an opportunity for Eric Bieniemy to really reset the board. And I think this is a game where you want to go 50-50 in terms of run throw. You want to keep them balanced. You want to keep the defense honest and really sort of surprise them with big plays when they present themselves. And so that's number one. And number two 
defensively, what I'm looking for is can you kind of bend but don't break? You know, given where they are in terms of defensive line versus that offensive line, I think LSU is going to be able to move the ball pretty effortlessly in between the 20s. But then once you kind of get them into the red zone, the defensive line will, as long, you know, from a pass rush perspective and all of that, those become kind of minimized to a certain extent because now you're hoping for, you know, there's space, there's a lot of crowd, you know, can you sort of manufacture field goals instead of touchdowns? You know, maybe they get a little undisciplined. There becomes kind of a second and 15 from the 20, becomes a first and 20 from, you know, the the 25. Can you sort of manufacture some scenarios where you can try and get them into the red zone and force some field goals instead of touchdowns. So those are kind of the two things I'm looking for, Will. And and can you try and sort of stay in the game uh, that way, where you're like, listen, we're going to have to keep scoring to stay with them. And then can we kind of find, you know, those half a stops, you know, instead of uh, touch, you know, field goals instead of touchdowns and so forth. So that those are the two things that I'm looking for. And if they can do that, we're starting to trend in the right direction. Completely agree, man. And I want to see AP. You just left us a really nice comment. A lot of people are trying to trust the enemy's offense, and they show flashes, but they take too dang long in the huddle. And for the play to develop in general, we have no tempo and eat themselves on offense. And, you know, we we went to Big Ten Media Day. Ryan Dyrud, the founder of LAFB, and myself were in Indianapolis. And the one common thread I made sure to ask, you know, Ethan Garbers and Jay Mike was how were they adjusting to the offense? And without hesitation, they both told me, like, you know, it was incredibly difficult to start. And they're still learning that. So I think the faster you can process the offense and kind of master into it, the more of an opportunity you have a chance to start winning football games and do it at a high level. And it's looked lost. You know, the first half of Hawaii looked completely lost. The Most of the game, you know, looked lost. We did have that nice TJ Harden touchdown run that got called back. That would have been a huge momentum. The line played a little bit better, but still there was a lot of it, – it, it's still been an incredible difficult scenario for UCLA football to generate the run game for themselves. You know, 167 yards over two games, three point under four yards a carry at the college level is kind of insane when you think about it, especially with what we were dealing with before in a Chip Kelly offense. So them generating some semblance of a run offense and building that confidence, and maybe it's not, you know, the 85 Bears defense out there, but it's still LSU and it's still a brand name you can kind of hang your hat on and go, hey, if we can move the ball against LSU, I know a lot of these guys were four, maybe even five-star recruits. We can do this against anybody. It's just a confidence-building scenario that you can do with that. And I think the other point I would make is if this team really wants to get it going – Yes, it's mastering the enemy's offense, but, man, it's also converting third-down conversions, man. Six of 21 through the first, you know, two games. That is a 28% conversion on third downs. If we can just make a jump in there, even if we're closer to, like, 40%, you know, that's a huge leap, and that can can eventually maybe lead to more scoring drives on the offensive end. You know, I, the big fork in the road for me personally is the enemy offense. I just think it's been too complicated, too complex. Yes. I've had a lot of sources, you know, off the record kind of tell me the same thing. What has been your, you know, thoughts on the enemy offense? I know we kind of touched about it after the Indiana game a little bit, but I want to hear it kind of laid out a little bit more as we head into LSU. Your overall thoughts on enemy because we talked about it. Eddie is talking about it right now. He says, had no hand in the Chiefs offense. He was just kind of there. We're starting to kind of, you know, think about that a little bit more as Andy Reid is kind of the mastermind behind that. But I want to see Biennemi and kind of what allowed him to be in the same room as these people play out. Give me your thoughts on Biennemi's offense. And- yeah, well, I think it it sort of what's interesting about Biennemi's offense is from what I see is it it doesn't really have a framework. And and what I mean by that is there aren't it doesn't seem like there are core concepts that he wants to sort of establish. And then you have variation off of those core concepts. You know, like when you think about a run and shoot offense or a West Coast offense or an air raid offense or, you know, a a power offense, you know, there's, there's two or three concepts that, that sort of come to light. And, and, you know, so for instance, concept could be, listen, it's all about creating 
the right one-on-one matchups of being able to get your playmakers in space and going one-on-one. Or another concept is really being able to get your running backs to be in a downhill type of environment more often than not. Or another concept is it's really all about horizontal movement and sort of moving the pocket and, and the quarterback and doing things off of play action. You know, getting your quarterback on the run and doing some sort of misdirection from a horizontal standpoint, having some people going one way, other people going another way. You create pick plays. You create sort of space through that. And then you sort of have variation off of those concepts where you're like, okay, you know, I'm going to stack three on the right to get this sort of one-on-one matchup. I had two of them go deep, one go short. Now I'm going to have sort of a more complex route tree that that counters all of that, right? It's kind of like the basketball equivalent of, hey, I showed you the fadeaway, then I'm going to show you the up and under off the fadeaway. Now that you know that the fadeaway is there and the up and under, now I'm going to give you a little dream shake, show you something laterally, right? It's the move off of the move. And, and great offensive minds, they have this framework of like, these are the three concepts I kind of want to have and then I'm going to build variation off of that. And what that does is, is two things. It makes the offense very structured in terms of very intentional of, of, of getting the right matchups and getting you to do what you, you want the guys to do. But then B, it sort of simplifies the comprehension, right? Of saying, okay, this is kind of what we're trying to do. And this is just a variation off of that. And guys kind of learn it and adopt it at the same time. With the enemy's offense at the start of this season, it just feels like, one place formation is just completely different than the next place formation. And that's completely different than the third formation. So it doesn't seem like there's like a cohesive framework or a concept or set of concepts that he's trying to exploit. He's just trying to kind of do everything. And in trying to do everything, he's kind of doing nothing right now as a result. And and that's what you're seeing. You're seeing guys that are confused. You're seeing guys that don't have a lot of flow. You're seeing guys that are very tentative. And that's where kind of the turnovers and the hesitation is coming from. So what I'd love to see from the enemy is, you know, really kind of establishing some core concepts and then generating variation off of that. And, and I think, Will, I know you didn't ask me about this, but I'll, I'll sort of just add it on. I think from the other side of the ball with the Kaika Malloy, I think this is also sort of an opportunity to, to have variation, right, based on your personnel as well. So I think there's an opportunity for him to kind of get in the shop and say, you know what, we're down our two best interior linemen. We have no pass rush right now. How do I attack this? And I think the way, if, if, if he's really kind of locked in and tuned in, I would actually come in, Will, and I'd rush three and drop eight, you know, because I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not going to get the pass rush anyway. And so what I would want to do is I'd want to rush three, drop eight, kind of the way Jed Fish did last year, you know, against the USC's and against, you know, that's kind of how Arizona went on this run. And what you're doing there is you're saying, I'm going to give up all the underneath stuff. And and if they're going to score, I'm going to make them go 12 plays, 14 plays, 15 plays. I'm going to make them take up five, six, seven minutes. And eventually what happens there is you're doing two things. You're A, you're shortening the game, so it's fewer possessions. So even if you are giving up the scores, the game isn't getting so out of hand because you have less possessions. And B, you're making a team that is struggling with discipline to be able to execute 10, 11, 12, 13 plays in a row without penalties, without getting off schedule. And that's how you can sort of manufacture stops and stay in the game. So for me, I'm looking for B enemy to sort of, generate a framework offensively and Malloy hopefully he's also kind of thinking and saying look given my personnel and given who I'm playing let's sort of maybe abandon kind of just the standard structure the way we're doing things this could be the day to just rush three and drop eight I completely agree because the run game for LSU has struggled to generate they had John Emery who believe it or not was thinking about transferring to UCLA at one point Season-ending injury in the opening game, he was presumed the number one back there. And they only have one rusher through three games over 100 yards. 78 carries as a team madman, 313 yards, four yards a carry. To put that in perspective, UCLA is averaging about 3.6, 3.7 yards a carry. So they're kind of in the same ballpark when it comes to the rushing attack. It's been a pass-happy system so far with Garrett Nussmeyer. Why not drop eight? I think that's 
probably the best method because, like you said, I had questions about these edge rushers coming in. We got maybe a little bit more pressure than we thought we would against Hawaii, but it kind of reflected back to form against a Big Ten offensive line. Get your guys back. Have them play. If you got a Kyron Lacey back there, make sure you're guarding like two people on Lacey at once as this guy has been unstoppable through three games of action. They had that three-headed monster we were talking about within the receiving room. And, Madman, it's been so, you know, dead within the UCLA Twitter. I want to just give one little positive. There's been two guys that I think deserve, you know, a round of applause for what they've been doing because they've actually played very good football despite the team on offense and defense not playing so great. The first guy, man, Kane Madrano has been so good. And we talked about him at the beginning of the season. He had three tackles for a loss by himself in that Indiana game. With those interior defensive tackles out, I'm really looking for them to send him off the edge a little bit more, generate more pressure. You know, you remember the Hawaii game. We sent him off the edge. He hits Braden Shager mid-throw, turns into an interception, forces the turnover. That wasn't an accident. Kane Madrano makes plays like that all the time. Leading the team in individual tackles, leading the team in tackles for a loss. We said this guy's got a shot at an NFL future before the season started. And boy, is he living up to it. He's been really, really outstanding. So I want to give a shout out there. And then, you know, the other guy that's made plays, KJ Wallace as, yes. you know, a slot corner. Four passes deflected in two games. Like this guy is not your average slot corner. Transfer from Notre Dame, transfer from Georgia Tech. I thought he's played outstanding in the limited amount of coverage snaps. We've gotten to see him play, so I'd love to see a little bit more of K.J. Wallace. And, yes, I know it feels like the house is burning behind us, but every now and then you got to shout out some of the guys that are doing good things, and I think those guys have been outstanding. I'm going to leave you with this, Madman. Give me the final prediction for the game, and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit more about defense as well. Do you think El Elkaika Malloy can show more of what, even without your Jay Toy is and without your Keanu Williams, can we reflect more of that DeAnton Lynn defense that he was taught last year and nothing has really changed schematically from that? Can we see more of that type, style of defense, you know, maybe in the LSU game? Yeah, Will, no, it's a great question. And and so happy that, first of all, Will, that you, you shouted out Madrano and Wallace. They've, they've been outstanding. Um, and, and Madrano is quickly rising draft boards here will i mean that you we're talking about a legitimate nfl you know draft pick here and he's he's rapidly rising and i think kj wallace has been just phenomenal and, and you and i it's great to see these guys sort of come home on the on the narrative arcs when we sort of talk about them in the offseason we talked about his big game experience you know how much he played the georges and the old misses you know um playing for for tech that he, it just it really shows his big game experience and he's really come through in a significant way. Will, I think this is sort of an opportunity for Malloy to do a couple of things. One is, to sort of the earlier point, if you drop eight, you're getting more of your quality playmakers involved, right? So we talked about, look, KJ Wallace, Ramon Hender you know, Henderson. We talk about uh, Davies, Kirkwood. But then John John Vaughns gets to be played more kind of safety than linebacker. You get Oladija out, out in some space as well. You get Ali Kehau out in some space as well. So you're, you're sort of getting some guys, your, your primary playmakers, sort of more on the back end, and it's sort of more conducive to what you're doing. And then I think the other sort of ace in the hole here, Will, from a defensive perspective of Am Malloy, wouldn't this be the game to have the Collins, a Champong coming out party? Oh, man. Right? We've been Bring waiting for He's an absolute physical freak. He hasn't had a lot of reps. You know, we remember we saw in fall ball, Will, end of spring fall ball, you know, they were, we thought for sure he was going to be on the edge and we thought he was going to be our answer to the edge at the start of the year, just given what, what his frame was, what his skill set was. And then we kind of sneakily saw him on that interior, if you recall. And we had kind of the likes of Medrano and Oladijo kind of rushing the edge uh, by committee. Uh, in various packages, this could be the game of, of Collins at Champong where he sort of puts it together. And what's the, what's better than sort of on the job training? You're, you're kind of like, look, you haven't played a lot. Just go and wreak havoc. We'll figure out the playbook later. Why don't you just go cut it loose, wreak havoc, let your physical ability shine 
and you're getting on the job training against a quality SEC opponent in one of the toughest places to play. So I think if I'm Malloy, I kind of say, let's rush three and let's just see what a Chempong has and, and let's see what we can sort of generate. And if we're getting something for, from a Chempong, maybe then I sort of bring more uh, up front, bring more in the box and it becomes balanced. And if I'm not, you know, I stay back eight. So I think there are some Danton Lin S concepts that can work here, uh, particularly with the Chempong. Yeah, and I thought Malloy really deployed a really great second half defense against Hawaii. I'm hoping he can bring that back in game number three. You know, I'm glad you brought up a Champong, man, because when we saw him in spring football, even though he was on a field away from us, it was like watching Bigfoot from afar, just the way this man is built. Six foot seven, 285 pounds. I mean, that is size level that you cannot teach. Former basketball players got some sweet feet down there. I would love just to see some potential of this guy, especially against a freakish unit, if you will, on the LSU offensive line. Two other guys I want to see, man. We had two transfer tackles and edges come in. Sheriff Saye coming from Florida a and I'm ready to see him play. Not a lot of snaps there with Al Pugh and our guy Jacob Busich on the other side. And what about Drew Tuazama, man? This guy was good enough to go play for Shane Beamer at South Carolina. I want to see it, man. Give me some Tuazama. Give me some Achampong. I need some Saye back there. Let's see it, man. We have some depth that we added. I want to see it. These guys, all three were transfers from the offseason. I think we're ready to kind of see what happens there. I think success for me, Madman, is this defense gets stops. You know, we talked about at length, you know, the 9 of 12 on third downs Indiana was. Just getting some stops would mean so much to this defense moving forward. And for offense, you know, this isn't a particularly great defense. It may have some talented players. Can we finally find a way to generate a run game? You know, we were there was inches in close, you know, scenarios where we felt like we were close to generating that run game. I talked about that TJ Harden touchdown that got called back. Can we get that going just enough where we can get maybe a, a, a burst of energy to this offense through the run game? And the run game opens up the pass as we talked about extensively. So the whole offense can flow a little bit better if that run game works. I think it's probably going to be about 42 to, you know, 17. I think a good game for us would be 42, 28, similar to like nickel state where in the third quarter, it's a close ball game. LSU eventually pulls away, but if you can just, you know, inject some confidence into this team right now, because it was so plain without it, you know, last week at the Indiana game, give us any semblance of confidence moving forward. And maybe on the back half of the season, we can surprise some people. But that's kind of my prediction. 42-17 as it stands. If you can make it 42-28, there's a lot to build upon. What do you think about that? And give me your prediction before we get on out of here, my man. No, the Thriller, I love it. And and I love the, the element there that you mentioned about the run game. Because, again, it sort of goes back to that point. Can you sort of be 50-50? And I think where LSU has been susceptible, Will, is to sort of the explosive back. And so, you know, when you look at how – SC sort of was able to kind of get into LSU a little bit. It was sort of a combination of Zach Branch early kind of in space and then Woody Marks late. And then when you sort of looked at Nicholas State, you mentioned they hit a couple of big home run runs, you know, in the first, second quarter of that game to kind of stay in it. And then you saw South Carolina, right? You saw some some great run game there uh, from South Carolina, big gashes. And so to me, this is going to be, is there an opportunity for TJ Harden to kind of see the field and and be able to make some moves? But again, and I'm going to keep going back to the well until it actually sort of comes back is this is screaming like a Keegan Jones game, right? I mean, when you talk about the explosiveness and the gashes uh, and the things that you can do, I mean, I, I, I just, I would love to see the enemy just hand it off to Keegan as, as sort of a lead back for a few rushes here, particularly against an LSU uh, defense that is susceptible to the gash run play. And so that's a that's a great point there, Will. So funny you mentioned 42-17. My score was 38-20. to You know, I, I feel like it's going to be 38-20. I think that UCLA is going to be able to do enough defensively to be able to at least make these longer drives. And, and I think LSU is also going to kind of shoot themselves in the foot Um, in certain instances where, you know, the score is going to be relatively modest. And I think for UCLA, 
again, being able to move the ball, generate a, a competitive game for, for two, two and a half quarters, and then kind of see where the, the, the chips take you, so to speak. That's kind of what I'm looking for here, Will, moving forward. And so I think it'll be interesting, the, the ebbs and flows uh, of this particular game. You got to think LSU's mindset is, hey, we haven't really put together a good game yet this season. Is this the game to sort of jumpstart our season? And I think from a UCLA perspective, it's, look, let's keep them where they are. You know, they got two great receivers, to your point. The running game is still very much in question. So that allows you to sort of stay in the game. I think 38 to 20 is is where I'm leaning. 38 to 20, that's a great call. I Listen, if we can get even closer than that somehow, I think there's a lot to take from this game, especially at Baton Rouge. So let's hope for the best. You know, it has not been an ideal start. We'll be the first to admit that. But, man, you know, trajectory and how you move forward from things starts now, man. You can't live in the past. You got to live in the future. Get out there, man. Make some plays, and let's hope UCLA can at least be in a better spot next week than where they are currently today. You guys have a great rest of your evening. We'll be talking to you guys soon. We're going to be doing a live show. Madman's actually having his first child with his wife, Ashley, potentially this upcoming weekend, guys. So give him all your love. Give him all your prayers. You know, it's a you know safe and healthy birth. We're so excited for you, brother. And, uh, you know, it's just going to be a life-changing moment in the best way possible, dude. No, so. thank you so much, brother. And, you know, it, it, it's special when you've, we've got great friends and, and loved ones like you in our life. And and so it's a uh, it's a sort of a magical time. So I'm kind of on baby watch here the next couple of days. Baby might come during UCLA LSU. The baby might be the, the special good luck, you know, for, for the miracle in Baton Rouge, you know. So we can we can hope, we can uh, we can dream about it. And perhaps our next show will, the live, might be live from Cedar sinai Hospital. So, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> stay, t- stay tuned, guys. You guys have a great rest of your evening. Much love and prayers. Fours up, guys.